Now, I want to tell you, and you know this, and it has nothing to do with me, it doesn't matter who the person standing behind here, oh, well, in a sense it does, but the preaching of the Word of God is one of the most important things you will take into your mind and heart. Again, not because of me, because I'm just a person like you, but if a man is behind here and he's studied and he's walking with God, God gives the ability to learn something from his word. You can also do that in your own study, and I hope you do. You can also be spoken to in many different ways, but one of the ways that God has uh, determined to work with his people is through the preaching of the word of God. That's why I do it. I study. That's why I bring different people in that are good speakers, because ultimately what I want is you to live for God, and I want to live for God. And we need the constant challenging of the preaching of the word of God to change our lives. So I hope that you um, will take preaching into your life, whether it's me, whether it's another good speaker, and that you would let that build your Christian life. So to start off, a couple questions. How many of you built a fort as a kid? All right? Yeah. All of us at some time or another built a fort, right? If it was in, and you can tell me some of your ways of doing it, okay? But if, if it was inside, you might have used blankets, right? Maybe the couch made it. Maybe the whole living room. And mom's like, okay, Pat, the fort's got to come down. I don't know. Or maybe it was outside with sticks, a lean-to, or snow forts. I got the privilege of growing up in the snow. We had lots of snow forts. Okay? And what did you do with those forts? You, you maybe hung out with your siblings or your friends. Or you were trying to get away from your siblings or your friends. Or you were trying to have a war with your siblings and friends. And we did that. Um, uh, one time with my friends, we had a bottle rocket war, which I don't know why we did that. But um, we were shooting bottle rockets at each other, which I only did once. I never did that again. Um, one of my friends got hit with it in the stomach and, you know, kind of lit up a little bit. But, uh, but every one of us has done that to some some place. What did you? You got the same thing. Yeah. Okay. But forts were an awesome thing as kids. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have been to a castle in Disney World or Disneyland? doesn't count. Okay, castles, okay. Now, in the United States, there's castle-like places, mm -hmm. but there's not really castles like they have in other countries. Um, so in the U.S., there are castle-like places, Cinderella's castle, okay? But Europe was covered with them, and they were the real deal. Now, where did you get to go? Camp Pamela? Oh, shoot. I've been everywhere. Uh, <laughs> Just name a couple, Germany. if you know. Austria. Anyone else? I put you on the spot, sorry. Scotland. Scotland, okay. Scotland. Any others? Germany. Germany, is that what you said, Susan? Okay, very good. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about castles today. Europe was literally covered with them. One author said this, more than 15,000 castles stretched across Europe into the Far East. Now, and, and hundreds of those are still standing. And again, some of you have been there. I'm going to name another one that I know Pam's been to, and she'll, she'll remember as soon as I talk about it. But um, the author that gave me some information for this, I had a chance to meet in Stockton. His name is Ed Dunlop. Here's a sample of his exciting medieval Christian stories for young people. I want you to think of this and put your mind there. It says, The cavalcade of dark nights thundered across the ridge and swept down the grassy slope towards the drawbridge. Drawbridge, high atop the castle walls, the sentry saw them coming and dashed for the portcullis release. The portcullis crashed down. Slowly, slowly, ever so slowly, the end of the drawbridge lifted clear of the castle approach and moved steadily upward. The castle gate slammed shut with a crash and the heavy bars thudded into place. The castle entrance was secure. The leader of the Dark Knight shouted angrily as he reined his powerful war horse to a standstill. There was no point in pressing the attack. The castle was secure thanks to an alert sentry. That's just a, a little idea from a medieval type story of what castles were like. Ed Dunlop goes on and says, One of the most unique and fascinating structures ever built by man has to be the medieval castle. The castle could take up to 20 years to build, and it could, in our t today's prices, would be millions. Now, today, maybe even close to billions, who knows? But the castle designers were keenly aware that they had enemies, okay? So the construction was on purpose, but it had one purpose in mind. What was the purpose? And I asked Nate on the way, and he 
answered it perfectly. What was the purpose of a castle? If you could do it in one word. Protection. Protection. Okay, protection is the word. The castle designers were keenly aware that they had enemies, and the castle designs reflected this awareness. From the towering walls and the battlements to the massive gates and portcullis, everything about a castle says protection. In these current times, I ask you, spiritually, do you think we need a castle? Do, we, do you think we need to protect ourselves? I guarantee it. We're being hit every corner. We've talked about our youth. The youth are being attacked unmerc unmercilessly. We need castles in our lives. But in these current times, I hope you would agree, we need castles from our enemies. You're, you, we don't need a moat, per se. We don't need a drawbridge at our house, although it probably would be cool, right? We don't need that, okay? But we certainly need one spiritually. And we'll talk about, I'd like to talk to you about that today. You know why? Because there's enemies from within. Do you realize that you have some enemies? You have an enemy living right inside of you. You say, I'm not a bad person. Yeah, you are, kind of. You know, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. We'll talk about that. We have enemy, an enemy within, and we have enemies without. And everyone, if I asked you if you had an enemy within, if I asked you if you ever struggle with sin, or you ever struggle with the flesh, or you ever do something wrong, then I hope you would understand, yeah, I do. I have an enemy within. Mm -hmm. But there's also enemies without. Enemies from within and out. We have enemies spiritually that would desire our complete ruin. We actually have enemies out there that want us dead. Did you know that? First so Peter 5, 8, you know the verse. We have a mortal enemy. If he could kill us today, he would kill us today. You know, he's using politicians. It's amazing what we put up with. And I think the reason we put up with it is because we're asleep or we don't think we can actually do anything about it. But there's leaders that want to depopulate our world. They said it out loud. And what do we do? We just let them be in power. We just keep making them billionaires. But there's people within, or there's a person within, and there's some people without, they would happily kill us. They would happily kill us. I can name the names. You know them if you have a... If you, if you have any sense, there's people that want to limit the populations of our world. It's funny, they never volunteer to die themselves. They never, they're never willing to do that. Why? You know why? Because they want to be left standing. They want to have the power. So but there's enemies from within and without. But 1 Peter 5, 8, the roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan would love to consume us with violence if he could. Uh, Heather showed me... Uh, Accidents, crazy accidents, right? Uh, somebody sent it to her video. And um, I'm watching this video, and this guy, you can't see him. They have a dash cam on their car, and they're driving along. All of a sudden, you see a car flying through the air. And I'm like, I thought that was only on A-team or something. This car is like 30, 40 feet up in the air, flying. And the lady starts screaming. The car comes, slams down. The lady lives through the accident. I mean, we got some crazy stuff. Uh, but there's actually, that was an accident, but there's actually people who would like to take our lives. Mm -hmm. Satan is definitely the cause of all that. But there are, un, but you know what, there's enemies that subcontract for Satan. And one of them is the world system, and one of them is us. We're our own worst enemy so many times. We're going to talk about a man today who is his own worst enemy, and I hope we can learn something. But um, this world system is is in trouble. I mean, it's actually trying to cause us to go the wrong way. Not necessarily people, but the world system, Satan's design. But there's also us, our own selves, betraying ourselves. Jeremiah 17, 9, you know it, but it says the heart is deceitful. And the verse goes on, you know. But I want you to know your heart is deceitful, my heart is deceitful. Our heart would not like us to have safety in that structure we're going to talk about. This world is clamoring with its ideas with its wickedness, they want to put out, and they want to stamp out any truth that could get you to go to God. And you might say, I'm fine, I'm safe. No, I can, if you, if you have spiritual sense about you, you can look at people you know and you can say, they're not listening to God. They're not listening. You might be looking at your children, you might be looking at your grandchildren, and they're good people, they may be saved, but they're not listening to the truths of God. And this world will throw everything at you to put out, to stamp out any truth that God could use in your life to get you into that final castle, heaven. Okay? That's what they want to do. Our title today is this. It's time to build our castles. It's time to build our castles. All right? Each of us needs a castle. 
Think of this. Our children that can't build their own castle yet, they need a safe place. You know who that's with? That's with you as a grandparent or you as a parent. They can't build their castle. They don't know how to spiritually defend themselves yet. So it's your job to build that castle. It's your job to have those children and grandchildren. Again, you can't do as much for the grandchildren per se, but you can have a great influence on your grandchildren. And we're going to see a man that I think, the Bible doesn't tell it, but I think he did have an influence on his grandson. I can't prove it, but you see some of the things he did is exactly what his grandfather did. All right, so it's time to build our castle. In our passage in a little bit, we'll learn from a man who almost didn't survive. In fact, he didn't deserve to survive, but he did. Through God's mercy and his choice, at the last minute, he made it into his own castle, but countless were, dis were destroyed and deceived by this man. I hope we can, again, we can learn from him. Oh, that we would get busy building our castle. Maybe you've already built one. Maybe you're securely in that castle. But you need to have your sentries watching for the enemy. Because guess what? Sometimes you can't see an enemy coming from far. That's why you've got to be up with your glasses to see. But there's enemies that want to find their way into your castle. If you don't have one, you're sitting done. So we need castles. Okay? In God's word, this idea is prevalent. The word castle appears nine times in the Old Testament and six times in the new. The new ones are all wrapped around Paul's life. I know he got taken into a castle or a, or, or a defense, a military defense. But the word castle means a defense, a fort, a fortress, a place of security. And I, I thought of this word right away, and it might give you great thoughts. Stronghold. You ever thought of David and his strongholds? He went up to the strongholds in Engedi. I think, have you been to Engedi? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there were places that David went for security from Saul's forces. We all need those places of security. So it means a defense, a fort, a fortress. The words are, these words are so descriptive. Uh, 1 Samuel 23, 29, that's when David went up to the strongholds at En Gedi. He did that to be safe from his enemies. When you get in a stronghold and David had his 600 men or so around him, you know what peace that gives you in a stronghold? All of us need strongholds in this world, big time. So, and God preserved David in his strongholds. The word castle also means a house fortified for defense against an enemy. It was also a house of a nobleman or a prince. And the term seems to include the house and the walls or other works around it. Other words that, other Bible words that coincide are fortress, a place of defense, refuge, things of that sense. Citadel, I don't know if that's a Bible word, but a citadel would fit in with this. But as, that, but as I studied this, I immediately thought of Masada. And Jan, uh, Pam has been to Masada. Has anyone else been there? Um, how did you get up there? Was it, did they drive you up there? Did you take a tram? What is it like? Didn't we take a tram? Yeah. Yeah. Masada. Now, it's interesting. The Greek or the Hebrew word Masada connects right to that word Masada. It, it's a fortress. It simply means a fortress. It's a place, again, some of you have been to. Um, it truly is a fortress. Again, I've never been there. I saw the pictures yesterday, and I looked at them again. But that's where the Jews fought to the end against the Romans, neither A.D. 72 to 73 or 73 to 74. They had some 950 people there. They said they committed suicide. Some say they didn't. I don't know. All I know is uh, it was a huge rock plateau. It was a difficult place for Rome to get to, and they finally did. They may know some more details. Check it out with them. But the point is, uh, this, it's an isolated rock plateau at the eastern edge of the Judean desert overlooking the Dead Sea. It was a fortress that someone could hide in and protect. And that's, I want us to keep that thought today if we can. So before we go to the passage, I want to lean on our author a little bit because he's an expert on castles. And I want to give you some of his thoughts. I want to talk to you about the strengths of a castle and then we'll move into our passage. But my whole purpose in this message is number one, that we're saved. This is foremost. He ultimately is our stronghold. He is our fortress. He is our refuge. If you are not in Christ, you are never going to make it. You've got to get yourself into that castle. Okay? So you do that through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the, his death, burial, and resurrection. That's your fortress. There's no other thing that's going to save you when the winds of eternity blow, when you step out of this life. You've got to be in Christ. Okay? So that's number one. He's our stronghold. Um, if we're in Christ, we're safe. But now as a believer, our time here on earth, we must fortify ourselves. Remember, Jesus said to Peter, Satan hath desired to sift thee as wheat. Um, he was after Peter. 
Peter did great things, led the apostles, if you would. Satan's going to sift you. If you make a decision, you're going to serve God. Satan, his minions, he might not need Satan himself. He might use his minions. But he's going to do everything he can to sift you and make you of no value for God. All of us need to take care of our Christian life. We need to fortify ourselves. This word fortify means to surround with a wall, with a view to offend against the attacks of an enemy. Military guards, they stand watch and they're looking to protect their people. You as a father, you as a mother or a grandmother, you, you should be watching out ahead. You shouldn't be running headlong into sin so that you're not guarding someone. All of us need to be fortifying our lives. Again, this word fortify means to surround with a wall, with a view to defend against the attacks of an enemy. Our children, our homes, our minds, and our hearts, the enemy will batter those walls. Here's what we're supposed to do, just in one verse. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. It's very important that you're guarding the seat of your emotions. Okay? Ed Dunlop says this, The weakest part of a castle was the entrance. There were occasions when attacking forces attempted to go over a castle wall with ladders and siege towers, and there were attempts to tunnel under into the castle, under the castle walls. But for the most part, the battle for the castle was an attempt to breach the entrance. And that makes sense, right? Uh, Masada, very difficult, even though the Romans outmatched Israel easily. It was difficult for them to go up. They couldn't. I don't know how they ended up doing it. Did they tell you there? You remember? Yeah, I think they eventually did. I think they stayed, stayed them off for about a couple of years. Yeah. But they finally did breach. So you see the difference? Okay, Israel was no match for the Roman army. But it, it, they were able to stay there two years. Mm -hmm. That tells you the difference. You can't fight against Satan. You can't fight for your children. You can't do that unless you're in some kind of a fortress. You're no match. But with God, when you walk with God... You're going to be able to defeat the enemy. Like, my kids aren't perfect, right? And I pray for them as they do the same. But Heather and I were able to protect them because we took it seriously. That's all I'm saying. Today, we need to take seriously our Christian wives. All right? The builders uh, and the designers, we're going to talk about that. So the builders and designers protected the castle entrance in five basic ways. And by the way, tonight we're going to finish this up. And then on Sunday nights, we're going to branch into something new, probably a book of the Bible. But... Tonight we're going to go into this a little deeper, how we can protect ourselves. But the five basic ways the castle designers designed it. First they had, what's the first thing around, besides the walls? Let's, let's say we're approaching the castle. What's the first line of defense? The moat. The moat, the moat would be a ditch, sometimes filled with water, sometimes not. Okay? That's difficult if you're trying to break, get into a castle if there's a big ditch around it, and especially if, if it's water. But they used the moat. What was the next thing? Now, again, you're trying to get into the entrance of the castle because going up is too difficult. You're going to get shot off the top of the wall. You can't go underneath. You're not going to be able to do that. So you're going to try to go through the entrance. So the entrance is going to be fortified. What's the first thing after the moat? Drawbridge. They, they drop that down, right? We read about that in the story. And, and it comes up. And so they can't get into the castle. So you have the moat. You have the drawbridge. Then you have the gates, and then the portcullis, I guess, that's a new word to me. That's the big thing that comes crashing down. And uh, it's a vast iron-clad grating that could be raised or lowered, often weighing in excess of 20 tons. 20 tons. Can you imagine doing that 500 years ago? Um, then they had the gatehouse, and they, they were able to, from the gatehouse, they were able to see what's going on, and they were able to shoot at their enemies. Maybe catapults, who knows? But... Uh, the gatehouse was the last of the five. A lot of these things in our life maybe appear physically strong, but our, but our entrance point to our life, where do you think those are? Help me. Where's the entrance point of our lives for Satan? Our minds. Yep. Our eyes, our ears, our heart. So uh, we may think we're physically strong, but, our, but we have weak, point, weak points. And where we're going to be attacked is through the eye gate, the ear gate, our hearts, and our minds. Ed Dunlop says this, we are in a desperate battle for our minds and hearts, especially the minds and hearts of the generations following us. Now, not only are there... Sick, so, there's Christians that are standing, right? And there's lost, and we need to protect ourselves from the world system, from Satan. But sadly, many Christians aren't even on the battle. They're not even on the battle. They don't realize that they're being, their, their entrances are being breached constantly. 
through what they look at. You might say, well, I don't really look at anything bad. That's okay, that's fine. Uh, we all have phones. We all spend time on them. All right? But what is coming through our eye gate and our ear gate and our heart gate that just make us easy going? Now, I'm not talking about we should be easy going. I'm talking about passive. What about all the things that keep us passive and not make us excited for the Lord? What about all the things that dull our hearing so that we're not cognizant of our enemies? Uh, I hope that these things will cause you to think about guarding your lives. But um, he says, we're in a desperate battle for our minds and hearts, especially the minds and hearts of the generation following us. How many would look at the next generation following us and say, they are weak? You don't have to raise your hands to insult that generation, but we can look at this next generation and go, what in the world? But thankfully, I have people from that generation that live with me, and I see the positives. And I want you to always remember, when God's done with us, he's always going to have somebody to lead the next generation. But we have a problem in our next generation because they're deluged with stuff that's ruining their passion for God. Maybe they still love God. Maybe they're still saved, but they have no passion to serve God. Maybe it's our fault because of the way we live our lives. I don't know. But there's a lot of enemies out there. And so we've got to begin building our castles. And we've got to be on top of those castles looking for enemies and doing our job. But um, he says this, Just as a garrison of medieval knights would defend their lord's castle by protecting the entrance, you and I must be diligent to guard the entrances to our hearts, our eyes, our ears. As Christian parents, we must train our children and grandchildren to diligently guard against the attacks of Satan and his evil forces. Now you say, how do I tell that to a five-year-old that someone wants to kill him? Well, you don't have to say it like that. But you can tell them that they have enemies. Guess what? They like stories, right? You tell them. You don't make up stories in the Bible. What, I, what I'm saying is you can present the truth of God in a way that will get them as a young person to start thinking about these things. <laughs> but we're supposed to diligently guard them. Our homes, our churches are, are under constant, unrelenting assault. Our youth face a withering, never-ending barrage of evil. Our nation totters at the brink of disaster. This is why, I hope you see it, we need to be building a castle. If you've already got it built, you need to keep fortifying it. You need to be on top and you need to be watching. Because guess what? There's a lot of enemies that sneak in. And we think, I'm fine. I'm walking with God. I'm reading my Bible. I go to church. And those are all good things. But is a Christian ever supposed to lay down the armor and say, I'm fine right now? We can enjoy certain things. But in the back of our minds, in the back of our hearts, we always need to have a vigilant spirit. Okay? So with these thoughts, let's look at, I want you to see four things from our passage. I want you to see four things. So just think about the need in your life to build. And we'll give you some things right from the passage that you can see. And then we hope to talk to more about this tonight. All right? So we're going to look at four things. Our title is, We Need to Build Our Castles. So we're going to look at four things from the life of the person in our passage. Now, we saw in our reading that this man, Manasseh, found hope. But let's see how this all started. It's a miracle this guy had any hope. It's a miracle this guy even lived and God didn't squish him. Okay? In verses 1 through 9, number 1, we're going to see a man who messed up. A man who messed up. And he messed up big time. All right? So let's read the verses. We're going to read verses 1 through 9, and we'll comment along the way. Look at verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. I got something out of this first verse. You know what it was? He was the longest reigning king in Israel, and one of the most, Judah, okay, when they divided, he was part of Judah. He was one of the most wicked kings of any of the kings, and yet he was given the longest reign. Learn a principle from that. God may give you a long life. Don't be wicked, but God's mercy is upon you. He may give you 20 years. He may give you 80 years. He may give you whatever. But this man was given a lot of mercy. And he's net, well, he's, he's a believer. We know that now. But people that live their life with their fist towards God, they're lucky in their life. People just live the way they want and they think, there is no God. When they stand before him, they are going to shiver and fall on their face and wish they respected the one that they didn't think was real. Right? So... Let's look at verse 2. So this is a man that messes up. This king was one of the most wicked kings. He was allowed to reign the longest. 
The long-suffering and mercy of God even extends to evil people. Look at verse 2. But, but did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So this young man, he was 12 when he started to reign. His father was a great king, a good king. But in the end of his life, he kind of was softening up. He was kind of getting off course, it appears. He's still a good man. Okay? Manasseh had 12 years with his father, and he had 15 years. If you know anything, Hezekiah was about to die. God said, set your house in order, you're going to die. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed and says, Lord, you know, have mercy on me. God in his mercy gave him 15 more years. One of the things that happened was he started to make some mistakes. He let, I think it was the Syrians, look into, or maybe the Babylonians, look into his house. And, and he, he, he kind of gave up some of his secrets or his strengths. And, and God was not happy with that. And Hezekiah said this, and I've often wondered, he goes, as long as it's good in my day. I'm not, I, I'm not judging his heart. He is a good man. The Bible lifts him up. But he let his guard down a little bit. Okay? He says, I can coast a little bit. And in those 15 years, he had a 12, he ended up three years or two years later, had a 12-year-old, whatever the math is on that, three years later. And then that 12-year-old grew up possibly in that time where Hezekiah maybe was softening a little bit. And by the time he's king, he's nowhere near where his father was. All right? So um, he, after having a very godly father, this son abandoned any sense of goodness. He lived for self. Notice all he did was in the sight of the Lord. I want you to know this. Everything you do is in the sight of the Lord. He's recording it. Proverbs 15, 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He's recording what you're doing. Everything he did was in the sight of the Lord. He's watching and recording all of our words, our works, and our ways. Notice also, he's doing what everyone else is doing. He's from the wonderful country of Israel. No country like it. They had God as their leader. And you know what he's doing? He's copying the world. How many Christian young people that were raised by good people who had a passion for God, their kids are, they may have a sense of God, they may love God, they may be saved, but their heart is not in the ways of Hezekiah. Their heart is in the ways of this world. The things of this world draw them much more powerfully than the things of God. I'm sure you know people. You may be one of those people. I warn you, don't do what Hezekiah or what Manasseh did. So, he's doing whatever the world is doing. <coughs> Verse 2, he said, But did that which is evil on the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He gave them that land. He said, I want you to drive out all the wicked people, so that land can be a holy place in your place. Instead, they're following whatever the old people did that were there. Now watch what he does in verse 3. What, in verse 3, what his dad fought against and tore down, he rebuilt it out of total disrespect for his father. He had a godly father. His father saw the dangers in Israel, the idolatry, all the wickedness, and his father went to town destroying everything that would damage the people of Israel spiritually. You know what Manasseh does? He he pulls it all back together. He brings it all back. He rebuilds what his dad tore down. Total disrespect for God. Total disrespect for his father. Total disrespect for the nation he was allowed to lead. By the way, if you're given the opportunity to be a father or a mother, and you abandon what you've been taught, you abandon the old, the ancient landmarks, what a foolish thing to do. You're, you're hurting the next generation and further. And I promise you, it's not just going to be a slap on the wrist if you're a believer. If you destroy generations after yourself, it's not just going to be a slap on the wrist. You're going to be saved, but what a, what a talking to we're going to get. What damages will we do? So it's all about him now, running in the opposite direction. Look at verse 3. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down, and reared up altars for Balaam, and made groves, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served them. Verses 4 and 5. Also he built altars in the house of the Lord, whereof the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He literally brought pagan worship into the temple. Amazing. In verse 4 and 5, he went all the way into this direction. 
where God's name was to be mentioned. God, Solomon did this, and, and, and Solomon had this awesome prayer. He said, God, if you will be here in this place, when we pray towards it, or if we're in another country, or if we're in captivity, if we'll just pray towards Israel, towards Jerusalem, will you please answer? God said, I will do what you've asked. And now the very king of the generations from Solomon, a very king said, does the exact opposite to that holy place that was supposed to be for himself. Bad. So, and he built altars in the house of the Lord. Verse 5, and he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. So where God's name was to be mentioned, he defamed it. He replaced God in his own house. How about a son or a daughter living in the same house of a godly person, and they live in rebellion towards their parents? The parents are foolish for doing it. They should say, you got to go because this house is based on the Lord, and you don't want to serve the Lord, so you're going to have to live somewhere else. But you know what? We love our kids, and we pray for our kids, but sometimes kids defy the parents in their own house. How awful. But this is what he did. He replaced God in God's own house. But he did so much. So he, he dishonored his father, but so much worse. Look at how he punished his own children. Verses, look at verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit. And with wizards, he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Is he making a castle for himself? No, he's knocking down everything around him so that the, the literal lightning and power of God can come down to destroy him, basically. He's leaving himself no protection. That's how foolish Manasseh was. He angers God in verse 6. Verse 6, it says, He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. I don't want to make God mad at me. You know what? My life is in his hands. I want to ask him to forgive me. I want to walk with God. But now he outright mocks God and his word. He said, this is going to be my place that I'm going to, I'm going to put my name there. Remember Jesus when he, he flipped the tables over? He says, my father's house is to be a house of prayer. You've made it a den of thieves. That's what he did. He basically spit in the face of God. And when we do that, we think we're going to get away with it? Mm -mm. God's just merciful. He mocks God, and he mocks his word. He says, this is the place I'm going to put my name in. He says, no, you're not. I'm going to put every other God there but you. He angered God. Hope you remember this verse, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. It says this, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit, uh, he that sows to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. All right? So please take that warning. God's summer, summary of him is in verse 9. Look at verse 9. Let me, actually, let's see uh, 7 and 8. I think I skipped reading those. Verse 7. Watch how... He goes to provoke God. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, before all the tribes of Israel will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. God said, if you follow me, I will take care of you. I think by this time, if I have my, if my years right, the northern tribes are already in captivity. Okay? Manasseh doesn't even care. He doesn't care. He's going to serve his own gods. And we know where it ends up. But then in verse 9, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. So God's summary is, of him is in verse 9. 2 Kings 21.9 says this. Here's another summary. Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Their king was a seducer. He seduced them to do wickedness and evil. God's not happy. God seems to say after verse 10, let's look at verse 10, and that's number two. So uh, there was a man here that messed up. Now we're going to look at a man God shook up. A man God shook up. All right, look at verse 10. Verse 10 says this, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. So God's about to shake him up. God's about to 
change his world, if you would. God seems to say after verse 10, oh yeah? Do you think you're going to get away with this? I don't think so. Look at verse 11. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. Now think of this. Here's a king. He's doing whatever he wants. He's worshiping whatever he wants. He rips the good out of the house of God and he puts all the bad in the house of God. He's living like the devil, right? And he thinks he's in charge. And remember, you're not in charge. It's only by the mercy of God that you're doing what you're doing. Verse 11, wherefore the Lord, the Lord brought upon him the captives. Think of this, a king, and now guess who he's subject to? His enemy, the very captains of the guard of the enemy. He's far above. He's a king, right? So now the men that's running his enemy's armies has now captured him. It says he was taken in the thorns. Help me if you know what that means. He was either hiding and took, taken among the thorns, or they chastised him with thorns like a lot of kings do to others. They, David, I think, chastised some of his enemies with thorns. Okay? But anyways, he's chained up, and he's carried away into Babylon. He is now a slave. So God takes this man and shakes him up. Okay? This is a man shook up. So God seems to say, yeah? And I want you to know, it's interesting to think that it took God only one verse and only one situation to snap him up, to yank his chain. He had given him a long leash, 55 years of a long leash of wickedness. He did a lot of damage. He killed a lot of people. He hurt a lot of souls. Do you understand God's mercy and his power? God is merciful if he lets you live. He's merciful even if you're a good person and he lets you live. But do you understand his power? In one quick moment, God can get your attention. In one quick moment, he could change your life dramatically. I would encourage you, and I'm encouraging me, to humbly walk with God and to get right with him and to build myself a castle. In one quick moment, God can get your attention and mine. He was captured by the Assyrian, Assyrian army. I hope you can picture it. Among the thorns, and he's chastised with them or bound with chains. He's carried away. But here's where hope in a horrible situation came. Now, it was not horrible that he was in this situation. He deserved it. He deserved every bit. He should have died earlier. Okay? He deserved every bit. But the horrible thing was him. He was the horrible thing. He was a horrible person. 2 Kings 21, 16 says, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. That's how wicked this man was. But hope came because God had love to a wayward Hebrew. Number three, we see a man who woke up. So he was messed up. God shook him up. But now he's a man who wakes up. And I hope you will let God wake you up. Sometimes there's preaching and there's things that you know people need to get right. I've seen some people come in here and they're not saved. And I'm not, I don't have any power to save anyone. I don't have any power to do anything. Only the power is if I surrender to God and he is able to speak through me. No matter what, when the word of God is spoken, it will never return void, Isaiah tells us. But how much better if I will walk with God and pray to God for me to say the right things. And then, but that's not enough. I could be right with God and the word is right. But if someone won't listen, the word of God is not going to have the effect it could have. We need to pray for people to wake up to the truth. By the way, let's look at verses 12 and 13 and we'll, we're almost done. Verse 12 and 13. And when he was in affliction... He besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplications and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. This wasn't a token apology like you hear many people say, okay, I'm sorry. He's like, okay, okay, I'm sorry. Now, and he, and by the way, I don't think he had his fingers crossed behind his back. Maybe some of the young people don't know what that means. But remember when you do this, then your apology doesn't count. Or you, you're, you know what I mean? That wasn't Manasseh. We know that because if he did not make this decision, he would be dead. And he would be in hell today. This man is a great example of repentance. We know it because he did exactly what God told him to do. And God restored him. God not only restored him, forgave him, but he let him go back into power. Amazing. So he's a man who woke up. This, again, this wasn't a man that says, I'm sorry now, that I'm cough. The word affliction means distress, continued pain of body or mind, calamity, adversary, adverse, adverse, the adversity, persecution. He's literally in the hands of his enemies. 
they'd be like us, mocking, and then all of a sudden be captured by Hamas. We need to put that into perspective. You know, where Hamas would do evil things to you. That's what happened to Manasseh. He wouldn't listen to the word of God through the prophets. He wouldn't listen to anything. God had to put him into affliction. Don't let yourself have to be put into affliction. Remember, 1 Corinthians says, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Simply judge yourself, and you'll be spared from the judgment of God. But, so he wakes up. Here in this situation, he besought. Think of that. He went out of his way. He besought. Besought is a powerful word. He sought for God. Watch this. Look at that verse. When he was in affliction, he, sought the, he besought the Lord his God. Something brand new is here. Now the Lord is his God, not these pagan gods. Manasseh isn't in charge anymore. He surrendered now. He sought out God. He's fully broken and repentant. We know this is true because of what God does. His relationship with God is real. He knows him now. Hallelujah. He's not just a Hebrew or a Jew. He's a completed Jew. His faith is connected to God. He's saved. He's forgiven. He's in the hands of his father. He's a jewel in God's hands. He humbled himself greatly, the Bible says. God is ready to do business with him now. If you're not right with God, you'll simply humble yourself greatly and seek out God. He's going to answer you. He says, draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. It's a law. If you're willing to go towards God, he's going to answer you. But if you won't, he's under no obligation. In fact, he will reject you if you're lost one day. And I think God would do that. Yes, he'll do that. You've got to come into his stronghold. So he humbled himself greatly. God's ready to do business. He abased himself truly before God. You know, we have a promise from God. If we humble ourselves, he'll exalt us. That's Luke 18, 14. We have a promise. He prayed, he asked of God to hear him, and he did. What hope we have in God. Even this wicked man should show you God's amazing forgiveness. But God heard his supplication. His earnest request brought him home and back to his kingdom. Someone could have easily replaced him. How many times in the kings? I think there was 19 or 20 kings in the north, and every one of them's bad. And 19 or 20 or so of the southern kingdom, and many of them were good. But Someone could have easily replaced him. Many of those stories, servants are killing the master when he's sleeping. Remember ish He got killed when he was resting on his bed at noontime. But somehow his kingdom was preserved for him. Then he knew that the Lord, he was God. He, he repented not to get out of a jam, because he, but simply because he knew he was wrong. It was true repentance. Lastly, number four, what change did this make in him? Number four, he became a man who stood up. He became a man who stood up. Look at verses 14 through 16. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David. Look at what he's doing. Why did he do this? He's right with God now. He's been forgiven. He's been restored. He now has a relationship with his father. What is the first thing he does, the Bible says? Verse 14. Now after this, he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon, in the valley, even to the entering in at the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and watch this, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. He didn't care about Judah before. He was killing them all. Okay? Now he's trying to protect the people. And these outlying cities were fenced. He was putting captains, mighty men, in these places to protect his own people. He was doing something for his people. So, He's a little late, a lot late actually, but not too late. He stood up and built his castle. Look at verse 15. And he took away the strange God. So not only is he physically protecting his people and himself, now he's repairing his relationship with God. These are all ways to build a castle for yourself. Protect others. Fix your situation internally. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord. He could have done this. He could have followed his dad, but he had to learn the hard way. But now he's going back to what his dad taught him, back to what is right. And he took the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. So they saw him put those things there. And now they're seeing him take them out. They're seeing a difference in his life. Your your testimony is very important. And then verse 16, watch this. And now he's getting even deeper and more personal with God. And he repaired the altar of the Lord 
and sacrificed there on peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So now he's affecting other people. He's come full circle. Amazing. So he did what every God-fearing believer would do, prepare a place of shelter, defense, and protection. Noah did that, by the way, remember? God told Noah something bad was going to happen. Noah was not like Manasseh. He lived godly from all the way through, right? But he prepared an ark for the saving of souls, eight souls. Noah did it, saved the lives of the eight, saved the human race. He built a, uh, Manasseh built a wall in verse 14, a long gate and all around it. And he made it a very great height. Why? He didn't want any enemies coming in. He says, no more of this stuff. No more of the damage I've caused. I'm going to do it high. He makes it a very great height. But he doesn't stop there. He puts mighty men, captains of war in all the fenced cities. He's right with God. He's been given another chance. By the way, how, a lot of times you say, oh, he's been given a second chance. He's a, he had hundreds of chances probably, right? But he took it. He took his chance, finally. But he doesn't stop there. He puts mighty men. He's right with his God. He's been given another chance. He fortifies his cities. But that's good, but it's external. He goes to the heart. In verse 15, he empties the Lord's house of all he polluted it with, and he threw them out. He got rid of sin in his life and in God's house. But he goes deeper. He now replaces the wickedness of his heart with worship. Do we see now in Manasseh's life how to build your castle? That's just a fast thing, but you can look at the spiritual principles here. How many this wicked get a second chance? Not many, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, everyone has this chance, but it's in their hands. Will they really wake up? Will we, will we wake up before it's too late? 